Hello everyone and uh, welcome to this webinar today which we're partnering at BPFI uh, with Deloitte and we're delighted to be able to do that. We had a really successful series with Deloitte last year on the future of banking and the whole issue of digital banking and the importance it plays is absolutely crucial. So it's great to be able to have a look at the banking uh, maturity report that Deloitte have produced and to see learnings from that and also to see the the champions who are doing so well and what we can learn from them and also what we can learn here in Ireland. Um, I think it's really important that we understand the changes that are going on since COVID and um, the whole digitalization issue across the sector has just accelerated and that's good from the perspective of competition, it's good from the perspective of ultimate profitability and rate of return because we know that across Europe there's huge challenges in terms of getting new equity into the sector because of the lower for longer interest rate environment and the challenges uh, that the industry faces. But it's also good from a reputational perspective and um, doing things that customers want, especially a younger generation of customers, to help them go about their banking needs and requirements and for businesses as well is crucial to the reputation of the sector. So getting this right and um, seeing the kind of benchmarks that are there, looking at best practice, making sure that we can learn from each other, learn from the marketplace, and encourage that kind of competitive environment is absolutely crucial uh, to the advance of the sector and what it can do for people and the kind of key role that it plays uh, in society. So we're delighted to be partnering uh, with Deloitte today uh, for their thought leadership in so many areas, uh, but also for their initiative here. And we think we can learn a lot from that partnership. I'd like to ask uh, David Dalton uh, from uh, Deloitte uh, to now take over. Thanks a lot, David. And thank you, Brian. Thanks for the introduction. And as always, thanks to the BF BPFI for um, co-hosting uh, with us. We're really uh, delighted about that. Um, my name is David Dalton. I'm a partner in Deloitte and I lead our financial services practice in Ireland. Um, I'm delighted to be introducing this webinar today um, focused on the future of digital banking and in particular to uh, really focus in on what some of the leaders or champions um, in the digital banking space are doing. Um, we're using uh, the fourth uh, edition of a global digital banking study that we've run for the last number of years. Uh, it was recently completed uh, at the tail end of 2020. Uh, it covers more than 300 banks globally, including Irish banks, and is based on the in with, with input from over 6,000 customers. So it's, it's, uh, it's a really interesting and insightful study. Um, in a few minutes, I'm going to moderate a panel to have a discussion around some of the perspectives on, that come out of that study with leaders from MBank, Santander, KBC, as well as the uh, lead Deloitte partner who ran the study. Um, but before that, um, I'm going to hand over to Yvonne Byrne. Yvonne is a uh, partner in our Deloitte digital uh, practice, and she leads our focus around financial services. And Yvonne's going to take a few minutes to talk through some of the uh, themes and, and highlights and insights from the study uh, and that will provide a really good kind of tee up for our panel discussion uh, to, which will follow this. Yvonne, over to you. Thanks David, thank you um, and hello everyone, great to be here. As David said, my name is Yvonne Byrne, I'm a partner in Deloitte Digital here in Dublin and I uh, have 20 years in financial services. Um, Half of that is in industry. I worked with the Royal Bank of Scotland and Tesco Bank back in the day. And uh, the, the last 10 years I've been working within consulting um, and with Deloitte for the last six years. So I'm delighted to be here. Uh, and really my role, and I'm not afraid to say my role here today is to, to be a bit of the warm up act for uh, our main event. We have uh, fantastic panelists here who've joined us today uh, uh, just to share their experiences and they really represent uh, what, what, what it means to be a, a true digital champion. So I think they'll bring to life some of these key themes that I'm about to talk you through as well. What I wanted to do is uh, just to take a little bit of time to give you some context on the digital uh, banking maturity study. So what it is, what our methodology is and some of the key findings. There's a lot, an awful lot of detail in this study and uh, we're not going to have time obviously to go through it all today. Um, but you are going to receive more information after this. You'll get access to the study itself. And, uh, and obviously, if you want to get into more detail about your specific business, uh, we can certainly have uh, a dedicated session around that because there, there's a lot to absorb here. So look, a little bit about the study. This is the fourth edition of the study. And as you can see year on year, the coverage across uh, banks uh, has grown. Uh, there was probably an expectation this year to grow to probably more countries, but with COVID, 
it did have an impact on that plan. Nevertheless, the study does cover, as David said, 318 banks across 39 countries, and actually it's grown beyond EMEA uh, to include some of Asia and South America as well. So it's the largest uh, global study of its kind. So it's really exciting and uh, an incredible kind of depth of research that, that we have in our hands. We might just jump onto the next slide, please. So just, just a bit of context on the actual methodology. So it, it's made up of really three components. Uh, the first is we completed analysis and benchmarking of over 1,100 functionalities through Mystery Shopping. Uh, we actually talked to over 5,000 customers. They were surveyed where we really wanted to understand their needs assessment, understand actually their perception and preferences around what's important to them across the key interactions. So it helped us to really understand what was important from a customer perspective. And finally, a user experience study was undertaken to assess the usability across some of the key channels. And these three com components really combined to determine what the maturity score um, for each bank was and ultimately where each country lies in terms of the study overall. Okay, so next slide, please. So this is the coverage. The 1100 functionalities track across six stages of the journey. So we've got information gathering, account opening, customer onboarding, day-to-day -day banking, expanding the relationship and ending the relationship. So it's very comprehensive. And we have deliberately tried to touch um, every point of interaction with the customer. Next slide, please. So some key takeaways, and just these are just some of the high level kind of headlines, I guess, just to call out. Um, in terms of the, the champion banks, what came out quite strongly was some of the key champion banks were clearly outperformed their peers um, and have a lower cost income ratio and a clearly a higher return on equity. So there was a real obvious kind of bottom line impact in terms of kind of digital champions and uh, their counterparts. We also found the digital champions improved all digital channels, not just their app or mobile or, or desktop, but they were particularly focused on, on account open. They did it across all channels. And, you know, unsurprisingly, COVID-19 over the last kind of 10 months has absolutely kind of fast-tracked that through COVID. So more and more banks, over 60% of banks have obviously reduced their kind of branch offering and have fundamentally invested much more in digital features. What we find as well is the digital uh, or the challenger banks have focused on retail and digital channels. So they've been very, invested very, very heavily in end to end digital sales to make sure that that kind of usability and customer experience is up to scratch. And then the other key thing that has come out is around user experience. So what's come out really clearly is that UX and doing the basic things really, really well is a really key differentiator in driving customer satisfaction. But in terms of kind of the meat of this, what we want to get into really is that how were banks and how were each of the countries assessed? And essentially they were put into four key segments, latecomers, digital adopters, smart followers, and digital champions. We might just flick to the next slide. So I don't know whether this is surprising or unsurprising, but um, Ireland ha has come out very clearly as a latecomer. And that position hasn't really changed uh, since the last study in, in 2018, I guess. So we, we have probably kind of moved up a couple of a couple of blips, but um, but not not too much really. And as you can see, we're we're just behind the likes of Colombia, Romania, Greece, and ahead of Serbia and Hungary. So you know that, that's who we're kind of in and around. But the digital champions of 2018 really have maintained their positions um, quite broadly. So you know, you likes of kind of Turkey. Yappy Credit is coming out of, as, as a real digital champion. Uh, Spain, Santander, Singapore, Santander, Russia, Spearbank, um, and Tinkoff are really clear kind of um, players and, and digital champions that are, are really kind of leading the charge here. And obviously Poland is up there as well. And we've got uh, our panelists from Santander and Mbank um, are really kind of leading the charge from, from a Polish perspective. So, you know, what's kind of clear and what's coming out here is that the digital champions have been driven very much from kind of more competitiveness and intensive, in, intensity in the market. So, for example, in Russia, Tinkoff landed and the incumbents moved very quickly really to pull up their socks. So the, the kind of drive around competition is key, key here. If no one kind of takes a first mover advantage, advantage um, actually what we're finding is it, it, it stays fairly stagnant. So more competitiveness is really good from a market perspective to drive that innovation. 
we might just jump to the next slide. So this is the crux of it, and this goes down, this is a, a one slide that you could probably break down into 300 slides, to be honest, so, so bear with me here. But this gives a very, very high level view in ter terms of where Ireland, um, I suppose, benchmarks across some of the kind of key interactions and journeys. And where Ireland fare well, and, and the five kind of key banks, is around cross-sell, availability information, and account opening. Um, where there are very significant gaps though to digital champions and even to the average is around some of the day-to-day -day. so account and product management card management pfm which we see a lot of the digital champions really kind of focusing on to drive more engagement much more deeper relationships and also transfers and payments so there's some of the kind of basic type of of uh, you know day-to-day -day type of activities and transactions that you know, right now we're we're kind of falling behind um, our our peers globally and some of the kind of key digital champions. The the other areas that we can see that digital champions are really doubling down on, and I guess are are, are I guess are focusing on in terms of driving a bigger gap from a differentiation perspective, is around the likes of ecosystems and account aggregation, uh, investment services and cross-selling into investment services. So how do you digitize the likes of pensions, investments, et cetera, but also beyond banking to deepen that relationship. So how do you diversify the relationship beyond just the day-to-day -day, uh, kind of banking transactions? Now, you, you kind of have to also call out that right now, if you don't have the basics in place, there's no point in getting into any of the beyond uh, the basics or the ecosystems. The, the, the focus right now from an Irish perspective is, Kind of getting up the uh, the benchmark in terms of the day-to-day -day transactions and then kind of focusing on, on seeing where we can kind of move from an innovation perspective around beyond banking but i think that is uh, that's when you've got the the basics sorted out so and um, there are some of the kind of the, the key fundamental kind of findings i guess what i would say is we haven't shown all the individual banks and and, and how they benchmark and, and how they perform for obvious reasons, but we can do that and we have that data. And we're doing kind of one-to-one -one sessions uh, with some clients around their individual results. And we can do that for yourself. If you're interested in that, please do reach out. We can do that as well. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's very, very rich information. It gives you clarity in terms of actually where you specifically benchmark against your local peers and your global peers and um, you know we can get into it in terms of a kind of more in-depth workshop what this is really is just kind of showing you that uh, the kind of key functionalities that are driving the journeys and it just brings to life some of the kind of key uh, brands and players that are really winning in the market right now against some of these key functionalities and what you can see there is you see mbank and you see santander and you see kbc um, on this chart. Uh, so they, they are really uh, th three of a group that are leading a really strong chart. So, you know, what's what's really kind of uh, will be really interesting to hear now is their perspective in terms of what they're doing, what they're putting in place and actually, you know, what their plans are for the future to actually really kind of drive on in terms of uh, the, the kind of their digital champion plans. So with that, we might move on to the next slide and move to the panel. Thanks, Yvonne. Thanks. Uh, great set of uh, insights and summary of the of the study. Uh, I'd like to welcome now um, our panelists today: Michael, a colleague of mine; Yasik from MBank; Andre from Santander; and Fergal from KBC. Um, we might uh, start off uh, in a moment with just getting introductions from each of the panelists, just to maybe explain a little bit about uh, your role and your focus. Uh, do you want to mention to everybody we've got about? Um, 40 minutes or so uh, of Q&A here. Uh, if you'd like to ask any of the panelists a question, please feel free to use the questions box uh, that's on the uh, little panel uh, on the screen. Um, and we'll try and get to some of those questions at the end, so we'll leave some time at the end. But maybe just to start off, uh, Michael, you might just briefly introduce yourself and we'll uh, work our way through the other panelists. Uh, thank you, David. Um, Michael Wojcicki, uh, partner with Deloitte, uh, have about 20, 22 years experience uh, in, in the banking sector, uh, about half of that working uh, as a consultant and about half uh, working for uh, banks, including uh, KBC. 
uh, in Belgium and uh, Raiffeisen uh, in Austria, where I was a board member responsible for, for retail banking. So very happy to be here and to present um, uh, you know, our perspectives on, on, on digital transformations in banks. Thanks, Michael. You're very welcome. Yasik, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, Yatsi Kilin, I'm the Managing Director at MBank. Um, I am with uh, MBank since uh, 2002. Uh, the MBank was started in 2000, so I enjoyed the ride from the position of digital, digital attacker to the incumbent role in 2021. We are the fourth bank in Poland, and even now we put resist to new attackers in the market, such as the road. Thank you. Thanks, Jacek, and you're welcome to Andre. Would you go Good next? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Andre Pika. I'm head of retail transformation in Santander Bank in Poland. Santander is the third largest bank in Poland, and I'm with them for four years. And um, you know, I'm in charge of uh, retail transformation, which really means digital transformation and customer-centric <coughs> transformation. So uh, yes, I'm very happy to be here and. Uh, yeah, and very proud to be able to speak on behalf of a champion. Thank you very much. <laughs> thanks, Andre. And last but not least, Fergal. Uh, thanks, David. So uh, my name is Fergal Oregon. Um, I work for KBC Bank in Ireland. Um, we're part of KBC Bank and Insurance Group, which is one of Europe's largest banks. Uh, in Ireland, we're a slightly different setup. We're a digital first uh, uh, operator. Um, I work out on the uh, daily banking products, so current accounts, deposits, uh, also investments, insurance, cards and payments. Um, and really in recent years, I've very much moved around the digitization of those processes of those products and um, uh, trying to give our customer a best in class experience. Thanks, Virgil. Um, let me get started. Maybe uh, unavoidably, I can't escape COVID-19. So COVID-19 restrictions and impact have you know, have been very significant, I think, in terms of how banks have engaged with their customers. Almost overnight, there was a switch to digital channel channels, and clearly there's been a, a huge acceleration and focus around digital transformation. Um, Andre, I might just start with you. How has this impacted on your digital journey, your digital transformation agenda? How have you responded, I guess, to the, the, the change that COVID-19 has, has brought about? Well, thank you very much. Yes, it definitely was a powerful boost, powerful stimulus to uh, accelerate our digital transformation. I mean, we've been doing it for uh, for a few years already, but uh, to be honest, uh, you know, it was one of many priorities in the bank. There were many things, everything was important. Uh, but and since then, since we saw the drop in customers visiting the branches by 50%, you know, 20% more traffic in call center, kind of 10% more to 15% more traffic in uh, in our digital channels, we, we realized that we have to uh, basically concentrate our resources on digitizing the processes and on digitizing the the relationship with the, with the customer. Um, I think there was change on behalf of the customer, but also there was a change in attitude inside of the bank, meaning that um, you know, first of all, the the concentration on of 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 the resources, but second of all, uh, the people who were kind of reluctant, for example, to let go on certain restrictions, you know, coming from compliance and and, and so on and so on, they they became more open, and we introduced many new solutions that were needed at the time of the lockdown, and these solutions are here with us, and they are there to stay. So, yes, it was a big stimulus for change for us. Thank you, Andre. Um, uh, Fergal, just from your perspective, how has it been? Yeah, look, I think like uh, Andre, um, a strategy that was there before has, uh, I think, been turbocharged in the COVID environment. Um, I think what COVID has taught us um, it's not only how we all work together, because clearly none of us would have planned to have nearly our entire workforce working remotely for the best part of a year. Um, but also some of the things that we were thinking about customers, we really, um, we've proven some of those concepts and it's given us much greater confidence, I think, in uh, taking the rest of our digital strategy forward. Um, our customers, I think, have changed quite significantly in how they're using the products and services. So 
Uh, if I give an example, um, we were the um, we were the first bank in Ireland to offer all five digital payment wallets: Apple Pay, Google Pay, um, and so Fitbit Pay. Um, and while they, we had seen very good usage in those, the, the increase in 2020 was about 65%. Uh, um, and KBC has always operated as a cashless bank in Ireland. So um, again, that validated that move to digital and, and online payments. Um, and we've also seen much greater customer usage of uh, self-service options, you know, uh, around account management, uh, uh, PIN uh, management, card management, and so forth. And again, that's that's actually, funny enough, has reduced the calls into the contact center because I think customers are looking for online ways of uh, uh, solving those. Um, so then as a business, um, KBC, so as a group, um, I mean, I think digitizing the business has become a, uh, a much, much, um, uh, you know, it is now the, the core strategy, I think. Uh, and, you know, as a group, we share a lot more information and learnings across uh, the, the different entities we have in Europe as to the best practices. Um, and in Ireland, we are, you know, all of our product lines are working on a digital strategy. We, we recently launched pension products on a digital uh, platform. We're looking again at some of our investment and wealth management products um, and continually adding to the payments and, and card solutions we offer. Thanks, Virgo. I think that's really interesting, uh, both yours and Andre's comments in terms of just how it's changed, you know, and reprioritized the agenda internally. I think that's really interesting. Uh, just one of the things I think the study kind of highlighted was obviously this focus on who are the champions and, you know, versus early, early adopters, late adopters and uh, latecomers. Um, and Poland is clearly kind of one of those uh, champions, which is uh, great to see. Um, I'd just be interested to hear, um, and obviously in contrast, Ireland is kind of on the threshold of kind of late comer stroke, late, late, you know, late adopter. Um, be really interested from the our, our two two of our Polish colleagues um, just to get your perspective in terms of what the lessons, what what lessons there might be for Irish banks from what what has happened in Poland. And Jacek, I might just start with you um, if that's okay. Uh, sure ready to take on from you. So uh, first of all, I think um, uh, I am a little bit embarrassed uh, while referring to, to Polish banks as champs because I think the Irish bankers are very proud and should be and they're doing a very good job. Uh, the context is very important. So uh, the Poles were just lucky, yeah? Uh, lucky and unlucky, yeah? Because we had the communists, we have a transformation, we were starting uh, building a modern retail sector, for instance, very, very late. So we were privileged to take uh, take on this journey with more distant technologies. So I think uh, we're just lucky with the context. Uh, we, uh, we had uh, high margins, high uh, in the retail business, um, and not performing well traditional banking sector. Yeah. So the the experience was very bad, yeah? So this put us uh, in front. Uh, what we see also in the market that uh, there is no radical flip. So uh, uh, the incumbent banks uh, that started uh, this journey are still um, the best, the most dominant banks. So even if they started the uh, uh, transformation later, they could uh, remain as, as the leaders of the market. Uh, we also see that actually in, in digital banking, the, the supply of digital features, digital scenarios creates demand. Uh, so what we see in Poland is, is it was a massive investment of Polish banks into all novelty scenarios. The customers also, also responded. So sometimes you can think uh, ahead uh, what is happening now in new market and predict what will be the demand for services in the future. Uh, the last uh, position I would like to comment now is that digitalization is not a one, let's say, a one push, one project. Maybe at the very beginning you need something to change your internal organization, your um, the structure of your organization, the people who are inside the culture, uh, maybe there is a, a, a few projects to, let's say, modernize your uh, backbone infrastructure, uh, 
but then digital banking is very difficult to just uh, design once and implement uh, with the hope that it'll be working forever. It's rather a process where you can, uh, where you should, uh, let's say, uh, build with small add-ons to your digital um, infrastructure features, uh, uh, train people, let's say, maybe go agile, and uh, let's say move on with every step to improve your digital performance. Thanks, Yastik. Andre, anything that you'd add to that? Mm, yes, I would love to add something. I, first of all, I'd like to say that we are lucky because we had MBAC. And, uh, and that's not a joke. I think it's, uh, you know, in the year 2000, uh, which is a long time ago, we had a, uh, an internet only bank in Poland, which quickly had 1 million customers. And uh, this kind of prompted all the other banks to really seriously. Uh, you know, looking at the digital channels and digital banking, it was internet banking at the time. And uh, so, so we had this, uh, we had this, um, well, this competitor that, 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 that basically all other banks had to, had to catch up with, and they did. And it, 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 it kind of sparked the, the digital transformation journey in the entire, in, in the entire market. And so, yes, I've seen a few of such uh, transformative journeys in my career. So what I would like to say, I mean, first of all, uh, maybe, you know, we know that context matters. So there are no universal rules. There are no universal, uh, you know, advices, pieces of, of advice that would work everywhere. But um, it's definitely, it's definitely, I mean, there is a strong business case uh, behind uh, digitization. And it doesn't come so much from the customer uh, interaction, but I think the business case, so the return on investment, it comes more from the simplification of the internal machinery of the bank. I mean, there's so much that can be, you know, if you take a typical traditional large bank, there's so much that can, can be made simpler, cheaper, automated, and so on and so on. So, so digitization, and kind of enforces, you know, this internal tra transformation that in turn brings a lot of savings later on. So that is a powerful business case. Uh, and so the money invested will come back sooner or later. So that's one. The second, as Jacek said, yes, it is a process. It's not a project that you that you launch and you know, in a year or two you are done. You know, you will have your first uh, outcomes. You know, in nine months maybe. But then it's a, it's a quarter after quarter after after, after 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 quarter, you know, modernizing, simplifying, removing old things, uh, you know, introducing new customer experiences, and so on and so on. So it's a process. You have to be consistent and you have to be patient. And the third is probably the role of the uh, of the interdisciplinary teams doing it. I mean, making sure that there are no silos, uh, kind of staying apart, talking to each other through email and, and steering committees. I mean, such projects rather, you know, have less chance of actually winning in this, in this transformation. So these would be my three remarks. Thanks, Andre. And maybe just building on those comments and also a comment from Yasik as well. Clearly, um, to be a leader in the digital banking space requires, you know, a sophisticated leading digital engineering capability and, and, and beyond that, actually. Um, how do you go about, you know, creating that digital engineering capability in banks, particularly in banks where you have a kind of a legacy IT infrastructure, legacy IT organization and, and broader than that? Michael, maybe come to you, get your view on that. Mm -hmm. I, thank you. Um, I think, look, the good news is that there are legacy banks, incumbent banks, uh, who have become digital champions. Um, uh, so in Europe, we have uh, examples of Santander. I, I would even call actually MBank now a, a, a legacy bank uh, after 20 years. Um, KBC in Belgium, you know, BBVA, ING, uh, Spare Bank, which you, which you mentioned, so even in the context uh, of Russia. So, so I think that's the good news that it's, that it's doable. 
um, I think when I observe you know, how these banks transform themselves, uh, it, in all the examples I've seen, it starts at the top. Okay? It starts with senior management uh, who <laughs> essentially accept that, look, in today's environment, a bank uh, is an IT company with uh, some branches, um, with uh, a regulator, um, and, uh, but, but, and with a compliance department and so forth, but essentially uh, it's an IT company. And, um, and, and, and as a result, there's, uh, there needs to be, uh, from the senior management, a, an understanding of what is IT, okay? Uh, and this is what I think is, is a really a step. It's not a, a, a function which supplies and, 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 and provides uh, services to the to the rest of the bank. It's a core of what the bank is, uh, and so senior executives have to learn about um, IT. Uh, and I think that's what I would say is the the first step. Um, and then look, if we go in then to the details of of how a transformation um, is, is conducted and and what happens, uh, I think I would kind of break it up into two areas. One is uh, looking at your your IT systems and and really making the step uh, to go forward from from monolithic systems to breaking up those monolithic systems into into microservices you know through ip through apis uh, so that they can communicate with each other setting up things like uh, devops which are which are required for for continuous development so that's what i would say on, on the kind of the hard infrastructure side of, of it and then on the second piece is you know how you organize yourself uh, to deliver change um, and what we've seen um, in many examples of, of the digital champions uh, is an embracement of, of, of agile. Um, so uh, an agile organization where, which essentially um, breaks this barrier between IT and business. So brings together IT and business, puts them in one room or together in one team, uh, together, by the way, with uh, control functions like risk, uh, compliance, legal, uh, data security, and so forth. And, and and makes those teams um, setting the same goals, same KPIs, uh, and delivering in, in, in a regular sprint methodology. And and the last comment, and I'll hand it over to Anjay, who, who has a lot of experience uh, in the Agile space. Um, what's important uh, is is how those uh, teams are coordinated, um, and uh, and as I said earlier, they have a, a common purpose and, and, and common KPIs. So let me... Thanks, Michael. Andre, yeah, I was going to get your perspective as well. Is, does that resonate with you? Has your journey in Santander been similar, or have you got some compare and contrast with that? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yes, I mean, it, it, it resonates fully. Uh, I think there are two, there are two barriers to uh, digitization. Uh, one is, is this legacy architecture that is complex and huge and difficult to change. And the second is, uh, yeah, is the silos, as I, as I, as I mentioned. And, uh, and the way to break the silos is to introduce agile, is to introduce small interdisciplinary team of people with completely different backgrounds uh, that are working together, they are, that are learning from each other. They, they, they basically start to adopt each other's perspective. And after a while, they become a well-performing team that uh, that has all the competences you know at the same you know at the at the same in one table and in our case uh, as i said before uh, you know our story of digitizing the bank is uh, probably longer than five years now and uh, the introduction of of the agile way of working kind of two and a half years ago three i think now uh, i think it was a major breakthrough it was it, it really accelerated the, the efforts and also make the efforts kind of smarter, yeah? doing the right thing. So we, we, we started doing the right thing and what we are doing, it was faster. Just for the simple fact of you know, getting these people with different perspective to working really together, you know, flat structure, as little formalism as, as, as necessary. Um, yeah, good coordination, quarterly planning, and uh, and it 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 really did did help. And we still have 
complex and entangled uh, legacy architecture. It's still there. It's not so easy to untangle, but of course we are working on it. Thanks, Andre. I think there are some really good points from both you and Michael just around, you know, the organizational aspects of this, the ways of working, you know, uh, that are really important. Just moving on, um, I think one of the things that the study touched upon was ecosystems and how they're important in being able to deliver enhanced customer experiences more quickly because the capability already exists, you don't have to build it, but also to be able to extend the, the types of experiences to, to customers. Um, just interested, uh, Fergal, maybe to get your perspective to start off with in terms of how you use kind of ecosystems in bringing your broader set of digital customer experiences to market and any perspectives in terms of what's important in managing ecosystems, managing those relationships within, within ecosystems? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I think uh, maybe to answer the last bit first, I, I think any sort of partners or any ecosystems you get involved with, um, it's obviously important to align to your own strategy. Um, and I think your your picking partners or or whatever that you can have a deep and 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 a longer term relationship with, because um, you know I think once you start on a, per, a certain path, you want to be able to continue it. I mean, I suppose an example in KBC Ireland is when we. Uh, in 2014, we opened. We don't have very many high street uh, branches or hubs, but um, we made a decision in 2014 when we opened them that they would be cashless. You know that we weren't going to handle tra transactional banking in the traditional way because we could see that the future was going to be digital. But what that meant was it was very, very important that our cards and payment ecosystem was 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 offering that so that our customers had a viable and and what we believe to be a better alternative. So um, we have very good partnerships with Mastercard and our card provider Tesis. Um, that allowed us to bring on the digital wallets, um, uh, the Apple Pay and the Google Pay, uh, first in the Irish markets, and we were the first with those. Um, and I think the, the value of the ecosystem is, while it's it's challenging to bring the first one of those on, and, and there's a lot of work on, um, the strength of the partnership of the ecosystem is that the second and third and fourth one becomes a lot easier, uh, almost that it becomes a, a business as usual. So important you manage that along that. And then, um, the, the uh, what we found as well was that the value of managing it in that way uh, it works as a two-way. So um, we had a problem with our customers, you know, uh, getting onto our service center on lost and stolen cards, right? So um, and the the process around that was people who couldn't access cash couldn't also have a card until it went arrived in the post. So we were able to develop a solution working with that ecosystem where on our app you could cancel the card and the new digital card was instantly provisioned. So. Um, literally in a matter of minutes, a stolen card was placed uh, in the app. Uh, and these are very important elements. And, and that's where I think ecosystems really have their value, um, but also through kind of longer term relationships as well. Thanks, Fargo. Some very good points there. Yasik, what's your perspective around ecosystems? What's your experience from an MBank perspective? Uh, well, it's a tough question. Just as we are talking, I think there was an announcement that as for the ecosystem cooperation with third parties, uh, the, the Apple is extending its uh, horizontal consolidation and going into cars, this time with Kia as a partner. But uh, you know well how the, the partners of Apple usually end. So the consolidation continues. Yes. So uh, and I think this is this is very often how we work with the with the uh, with the partners with the ecosystem. Uh, the the general rule I think uh, we we uh, we keep is that if if it's something it's in our core business, we know how to do it, and it's essential to deliver a frictionless frictionless experience to the customer. It's something we are doing on our own with other partners. Um, every relationship to manage is a relationship to manage, so. Uh, it, it's um, an um, overhead to the to the efforts and a risk that the experience not we won't be let's say perfect. However, there are areas where actually the banks are not specialists. Like I think the cards are the payments and cards are the obvious example. Um, but I would say that the contact center systems are the same example. Or um, let's say we in even in our history. Uh, we had an examples where um, a, a new startup had a new technology, breakthrough technology, and 
um, uh, we we didn't uh, spend time to discuss how we split, uh, let's say, revenue from the business. We wanted just to be very quick in the market and enter this cooperation just to be the, for instance, a first bank in Poland who introduced um, instant payments uh, between customers. Uh, we also had an examples where the, the areas were so risky, so new, uh, that we cooperated with uh, vendors, partners on the basis of, let's say, common effort. Like uh, we didn't know how a new technology will end, but we, let's say, co-invested uh, in this technology to deliver something new to the customers. Uh, this is how we um, brought to our customers the, let's say, video branch, for instance. Uh, at the time, the product didn't exist. We are just building it together with the partner who then uh, got this product and offered to uh, to others. Uh, the banks, I think, usually, especially not 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 uh, it's uh, the French is a is a different market. But in, in Poland, the banks are not specialists. I think in insurance products, so it's very common, let's say, to have a good cooperation with uh, insurance companies to deliver together with banking products, insurance products, not only bank insurance but also standalone products. Uh, well, as for the future, I think everybody is dreaming to become a super app, yes? so to grab a more attention from the customer with the extended uh, offer of products outside of traditional banking and insurance, like, I don't know, uh, tickets, uh, uh, bookings, and so on. I think it's a, it's a very interesting dream. I think this idea is not, not tested so far. Um, I, some, some, uh, it's it's uh, driven by the best example I think from from China, where actually it's it's it really works. Everybody would like to be in the same space. Uh, we are experimenting with that, and of course, this is not our main domain. So the only choice was to let's say partner with the the platforms, the third party providers, uh, let's say just to put this feature in the market and test it against uh, customer demand. Thank you, Jacek. I might just remind everybody, if, if you want to ask a question, just post a question in the question box. Hopefully you can kind of see that on your screen. Uh, we leave a few minutes at the end to, to pick up any questions from the audience. Um, just moving on, um, just uh, I think one of the things that the survey kind of touched upon was a focus around digital channel challengers. So those players who are purely digitally focused and how they're bringing kind of innovative customer offerings to the market to help differentiate themselves against the, 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 the incumbents, I guess. Clearly in Ireland, we've had the likes of Revolution N26, you know, I guess in that, in that space. Um, maybe Fergal, just coming back to you, just how do you think Irish banks can respond and compete to these digital challengers and the types of innovation that they're, they're bringing to the market? Uh, yeah, thanks, David. I think, um, <clears throat> right, so I mean, I think Brian talked about it at the beginning about the fundamental shift in banking and, and the move towards digitization. Um, and I think you've got, you know, a, a very strong digital fintech uh, offering emerging or has already emerged a, a, against the legacy bank. Uh, I suppose how we see it in KBC, we see ourselves as the challenger bank in the Irish market. Um, but we, we do it different. We're, you know, we're definitely digital first, uh, and we're designing all of our products and processes to be digital first. Um, but we think it's important to be digital with a human touch. So we, we, we do have uh, a limited uh, hub network out there um, and, and a contact center. Uh, and we think it's important that our customers can interact with us uh, in, in, in a manner of their choosing um, um, and, and expect the same standard of service and speed of execution. Um, so that's how, how we position ourselves in the Irish market. Um, from a strategic point of view, then um, we have uh, we, in around Easter last year we did a, a, a full upgrade of our core banking platform, um, which I, I guess uh, positions ourselves for, for, for future change. Uh, and we also announced our transition to a, a bank insurance model in Ireland. So uh, while we've offered traditional banking products, mortgages, current accounts, etc., we're now offering pensions and insurance in through a digital mode. And I think that's again adding a distinctiveness that you know the fintech and the legacy banks aren't offering in Ireland. Thanks, Virgil. Uh, Michael, maybe from a, an outside-in perspective, what's what thoughts do you have? What kind of uh, advice do you have? Yeah, well, I think 
Irish incumbent banks have to respond, right? Um, when I when I look at the the chart that Yvonne presented and and where Ireland's position was, I was surprised, right, that you're a, a late comer, right? So I was, you know, Celtic Tiger image of of Ireland, uh, and 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 it was um, a little bit disturbed by that by that view. Um, so I think you know Ireland is actually uh, could be a target for disruption, right? Where uh, challengers come in and, and you know if you've got sleepy incumbents uh, who aren't going to be uh, aggressive on the market then then, then that's a, you know that's a, that's a great market uh, for, for for these challengers um, I think um, the, the, again what I said earlier uh, maybe by the way protecting Ireland for the and giving you a little bit of breathing room is the fact that it's you know you're a smaller country so maybe not on the the radar screen of of, of uh, many of these challengers uh, for now uh, on the other hand um, it's you know you have a high GDP per capita so so it also makes it attractive I think look as I said earlier and as, as we've seen um, the, the, the we have to remember that incumbents can do it right incumbents uh, can become uh, digital digital champions uh, and we heard a couple times uh, around the fact that you know context matters, um, and and what's the the market we are in, and and what is the context there. But you have to also remember that you know you create the the context, right? And so when I look at um, some of these markets which are are more advanced and and how they became more advanced, uh, in essentially all the cases it was actually an incumbent who made the bold step. Uh, and, and the bold move to uh, really transform themselves, but in a very, very fundamental way. So when we look at, um, at actually in Poland, it was it was M Bank, who, by the way, was a traditional bank that en entered into the retail segment. Uh, so that was a move. When we look at um, Russia, it was you know the incumbent Spare Bank who 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 made this bold move to to try to transform itself. Um, but I think, uh, and, and, and then Spain is another great example where it was a, a group of incumbents who, who, who essentially at the same time made these uh, decisions to, to, to really restructure themselves. And I think when I look at what those banks did, um, it, it wasn't you know, dipping your toe in the water. It wasn't looking at how do we traditionally run a project, uh, you know. Let's set up a steering committee. Let's no. It's it's it's. They look at it as a fundamental um, way of changing how they operate. Uh, and then what we've definitely seen in in more recent years, as has been mentioned a couple times, uh, is um, is this idea of, of in a way breaking the bank, uh, reorganizing it, uh, breaking these silos which traditionally exist between the different. Uh, functions like IT, business, risk, uh, compliance, and and so forth, uh, and 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 agile has been found to be a, as I said earlier, a methodology which um, has been quite successful in in, in driving uh, those sorts of transformations. Uh, and then it also takes um, a cultural change with the bank, uh, so uh, it requires, as, as Jacek uh, had said earlier. Uh, this idea of test and learn, so so constantly trying new things uh, and seeing what works, failing, learning from those lessons, uh, and moving forward. Um, so, in summary, um, my you know who is going to be, and my question is you know who is going to be that innovative, bold uh, Irish bank which will which will make the step forward to to a champion, and uh, and it can be done, it has been done. Uh, and it's just a matter of the will uh, to do it. Thanks, Michael. I think some really interesting comments there. I think the point about Ireland being, you know, potential target for disruption is interesting. I would say, though, in fairness, the Irish banks, I think, we had a financial crisis uh, a number of years ago. So a big focus has been on dealing with the regulatory consequences, I guess, of that crisis as well. So that maybe has mm -hmm. uh, explains a little bit of the, the results in the study. Um, just my, my last question before I go to the audience is just around brand and I think probably kind of building on some of the points uh, earlier, but to be successful, I, I think it's interesting just to consider where bank brands are coming from. So obviously built up uh, over many years in a bricks and mortar kind of world. Um, how do you make kind of tr these traditional bank brands relevant in a digital banking world and in a world full of digital, very powerful digital brands as well? Yasek, I might just start with you if that's okay, get your perspective. Yes, I think. And, uh... I'm happy also to announce that I have very good news to incumbent banks. Uh, we started as a 
100% digital bank and it's uh, both a blessing and a curse. So uh, in our market, we are still connected uh, first with, uh, let's say, modern digital channels, but there is a lot of bad sentiment yeah, because uh, customers do not change uh, so quickly. The majority of customers, frankly speaking, are quite conservative in terms of uh, banking. Uh, and what we see in uh, in the market in Poland now, for instance, that the best mix as for the brand is a mix of the very traditional brand, uh, uh, probably with the long history, uh, with uh, some backup in traditional model that is mixed with modern technology. Uh, I, I would say even that people laugh the story of uh, the incumbent banks that uh, used to be traditional and make an effort to become digital. This is what most of the customers really, really love. And we see uh, such brands uh, in Poland and some of them communicate it directly. So for instance, the, the, um, uh, uh, currently in Poland, the, the the message of Millennium Bank is that it's a mix of, let's say, traditional banking and the best innovative banking you can have in one package. And on the other hand, we, let's say, say the uh, Polish ING, uh, who uh, on the one hand is very, let's say, communicating a very modern digital channels, but at the same time, they, they propel their brand with the um, actor celebrity who is, I think, in, in his 50s or 60s, Every Pulse knows him and it's it's an anchor of somebody who is really responsible, clever, smart and have a long, long experience in life. So um, this is what I see. So the, the, the attackers, let's say, uh, are attractive for, a, for a people looking for novelties, for early adopters. But actually, it's um, uh, uh, once every incumbent banks is starting its digitalization, uh, it, it puts the, the attackers in a very inconvenient corner because they, they have a lot of assets for the brands. Uh, uh, the attackers cannot, uh, cannot collect very quickly or respond quickly, while the incumbents can very quickly add this digital novelty flavor to their brands. Thanks, Jacek. Andre, any comments you'd make on that? Yes, I think... Uh... Thank you very much. In the last in the last year, we have seen that people, the uh, the consumers, started to appreciate the the attribute of being of stability, of resilience, uh, much more than they used to two or three years ago. So uh, um, I think now uh, being being a traditional bank is uh, is uh, is good. It 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 really is valuable, but uh, uh, in the eyes of the, of the of the customer, but you know, being traditional and uh, does not mean you have to be stale. I think this is the big difference. You can, it's 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 not about uh, it's not either or. I think the best strategy for a brand is to be traditional and digital, or you know, uh, having roots in the history uh, that kind of you know guarantees stability. And be digital, and be friendly, and be uh, super convenient for the uh, for the customers. And we have such such examples uh, in Poland. Jacek mentioned ING and Millennium, but I must say that uh, our the largest bank in the country. This is the this is the super incumbent. Yeah, some time ago they were almost the only bank in the country, and they they had the uh, they had the reputation of of really you know stale uh, kind of unfriendly and so on and so on and so on today they have the probably the best or one of the best apps in the mm, you know in the market and they are modern they are innovative and they are still the biggest they're still the biggest and and they have a hundred years of of, of tradition so uh, you know they are a, a great example of a super traditional bank becoming a super modern bank over over you know a couple of years maybe five 
Thanks, Andre. So there's a few questions I've got in from our audience. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll pick up on the first one, which is, are there examples of successful partnerships with fintechs or do banks need to rely on themselves and transform themselves? Who'd like to maybe have a first go at that? Well, I'll start. Sorry. Thanks, yeah. Can I? Okay, so yeah. I think uh, uh, the the transformation is on the uh, the bank must do do it on on their own. Yeah, so it's 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 huge operation and do not count on fintechs to solve all your problems. I think it's uh, the cooperation as as is for my experience is just picking up from uh, some extra features, extra projects that can uh, distinguish your offering or add a flavor to your offering. But frankly speaking, I, I do not know the, the example where actually uh, relying only on the fintechs can, let's say, move you forward in uh, the, the massive, trans move forward the massive transformation of the whole bank. Yeah, uh, I'd agree with that, David. Uh, I, I would agree with that. I, I think it's it's very important to be open to these things. Um, and But what you tend to find is the, what the fintechs do is they do a part of the process really, really well. Um, but the bank has to consider the rest of the process and deliver that. So. Um, that, that, that there is the challenge, I think, with some of the cooperation. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say Mike. one thing I think also important is just to observe the market, right? So see, look globally what fintechs are doing and, and pick up, you know, ideas because, uh, you know, by definition, these, these are usually smaller companies, uh, banks, institutions, um, and observe, wow, this seems to be working in whatever, Sweden. Uh, and if it's working well there, then you can expect that um, it could work in your market. And so, uh, so, so basically observing and then uh, <laughs> adopting and implementing those solutions in, in, in your institution seems to work also very well. Um, just thank you, Michael. Just one, another question um, that I pick up on is uh, clearly individual banks, we, and a lot of our discussion has been around how individual banks respond, I guess, and, and what their efforts are from a digital transformation perspective. But I guess the, the essence of the question, is there a role for banks to collaborate with each other in how they respond, particularly to some of the challengers? Um, so I know there's a, a very specific example going on in Ireland at the moment, Fergal may want to comment on, but just interested if anybody want to comment on that collaboration versus trying to do it all on your own. Oh, definitely collaboration uh, collaboration in the face of uh, you know innovation coming from outside is is uh, is very good uh, we have a we have a a peer to peer payment system in Poland which was originated by five banks uh, uh, working together it's uh, you know it's it's a it's a mobile payment system you you basically your, your app gives you six digits and within the 30 seconds you have to use these six digits and you can withdraw money from an atm you can you can exchange money between people you can pay you can pay in the internet it's super popular and super uh, uh, convenient and uh, yeah it was the five biggest banks in the countries that that actually invented it yeah, I think that's very similar to the, the project that's underway in Ireland, and and yes, I think it's a good example of where collaboration can, can certainly help in, in the face of technological change. Yeah, and, and that example, uh, the, the, it, currently that, that system has around 40% of online uh, transactions are run through that cooperation, and the banks basically realize that individually they're, they're competing against each other, so create a, a joint offer. By the way, that, the, that, that can develop further. So. Um, there's also plans that uh, you can take from from payments to then you know consumer loans and and uh, and uh, buy now pay later type offers and things and things like that. So so yes. Okay, unfortunately time has beaten us and uh, we're now ahead of time and of course you can't answer some, pick up some of the other questions, apologies about that, but let me just give a massive thanks to our panelists, I think Andre, Yasik, Fergal and Michael, you've made some really great contributions, really great insights, really appreciate it, thank you for that. i uh, also like to just thank Yvonne for her presentation of some of the highlights of our study and also to the BPFI for uh, co-hosting this with us today, just to mention that the study is available on the Deloitte website and we will be posting a recording of this webinar on our website as well if you want to kind of uh, catch, catch it uh, again. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you for attending and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thanks.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.